Among the visitors was a little-known Dutch landscape artist called Piet Mondrian. Until now, Mondrian hadn't been thought a huge talent. He'd spent his early years creating a group of intriguingly stylized, symbolically charged, moody, rather murky landscapes. Uh, if you want to understand the incendiary effect that Van Gogh's art had on the young Piet Mondrian, there's no better place to start than here. This is his early work. Low-toned, slightly melancholic, slightly mystical landscapes painted 1905, 1906, 1907. But then, look, it's as if someone has lit a match and set fire to the world. This is how Mondrian sees reality after he's seen Van Gogh's paintings. Skies that seem to be alive with some kind of strange electrical charge. But what's interesting about Mondrian is that He's different from Van Gogh. He's fallen under the influence of the philosophical ideas of a movement known as theosophy. He has come to believe that matter is the enemy of spirit. So, for example, while Van Gogh might have said, oh, I want to paint sunflowers that feel like you could eat them like a, like a blob of mayonnaise, that's not at all Montreal's ambition. He would never have compared one of his paintings to food. What he's looking at what he's looking for is some kind of mysterious spiritual essence of reality that he feels lies beyond visible appearance. So his visual adventure will take him to completely different worlds. Like Van Gogh before him, Mondrian felt he had to get out of Holland. In 1911, he set up studio at the heart of the international art scene, Paris. In the early 20th century, the city was a magnet for artists wanting to be part of the avant-garde. Instability in Europe had fueled a mood of creative rebellion, with radical breakthroughs in all forms of artistic expression. In this heated atmosphere, Picasso and Braque invented Cubism, and Mondrian fell completely under its spell. From now on, Mondrian would still paint nature, but his individual tree starts to dissolve into a Cubist kaleidoscope of muted forms to express the universal, abstract nature of tree. As he squares off his environment, Mondrian moves closer to grid form abstraction, but he's not there yet. That style-defining revelation would come not from Paris, but almost by accident from the weather-battered dunes of Holland's North Sea coast. When the great breakthrough came, chance played a large part. Mondrian was actually living in Paris to be at the center of modern art. He got word that his father was ill and he came to Holland on what was supposed to be a short visit. But then the war broke out, couldn't leave the country. So what did he do? He came here to Domburg Beach. He had almost no money, just a stump of charcoal and a sketchbook. But he spent day after day looking at the sea studying the sea, studying the sky, studying the stumps of these piers. And the result was the art that he considered the great change. Mondrian would sometimes sketch by moonlight, or even with his eyes closed. So determined was he to find the essence of his subject. Mondrian returned from the sea like a beachcomber, with this. It's an astonishingly abstracted, distilled, reduced vision of the pewter disk of the North Sea beneath. The pewter disk of the grey Dutch sky. I think 
think we can sense Mondrian's rapture before the glitter and the dazzle of light on ocean breakers. We can feel the motions, the relentless motions of the sea. We can sense mists, fogs coming in across the ocean. It's an extraordinary image, and it's one, I think, that takes us to the heart of the difference between Mondrian and Van Gogh. They start from exactly the same position. The church is gone. It's no good to them anymore, but they're looking for some sense of the spiritual, some mystery, some sense of deeper meaning. And they're going to a new church, the Cathedral of Nature. But whereas Van Gogh is essentially helpless before nature, Mondrian takes control. It's the artist's job, in his opinion, to see the structures, to see the patterns, to see the deeper meaning of the world behind the visible appearances of the world. Hence, he distills, he purifies, he reduces, he purges. Now he sees himself as the pioneer of a new spiritualized vision, but how Dutch, how very Dutch this art seems with its insistent horizontals and verticals echoing the Dutch landscape, but not only that, Mondrian was the son of Dutch Calvinists. I look at this picture and I'm instantly transported back 300 years to those very first images of the purged Protestant church painted by Peter Sanradam in the 1600s. White space, lines, lines, structure. Nothing left in the church anymore but a cross. All he sees in the end, a cross. But while Mondrian was embedded in tradition, it's also important to remember that he was enmeshed in a very particular, catastrophic moment of modern history. This picture was painted in 1915, shortly after the outbreak of the First World War. And if you look at this painting, created in 1917, I think you can sense the shadow of that war hovering over Mondrian's spirit. Look at the way in which the cross forms have become heavier, darker, more oppressive. It's an image that to me very much evokes the mass graves of the First World War. Mondrian might not have had a conventional belief in God, but he did believe in art as a kind of divine force capable of reordering chaos after the war. He was sure that he could change the objective conditions of humanity. Only he could commit to canvas the perfect arrangement of block and line. Mondrian's stark grid compositions are his trademark. The Dutch landscape distilled, purified into something that he felt improved upon nature. 